entertainment, and I do a lot of different things, but recently I've been working on um, figuring out how to retake flat packs and build them within the Fedora infrastructure and um, out of Fedora content. Um, my talk, I mean, it's titled it as a tutorial how to make a patient into a flat pack, but it's um, going to be a couple of different things. I first want to just provide a general introduction to flat pack to those who are less familiar with that. We'll discuss a little bit about how we are looking at putting flat packs in Fedora, and then go go ahead and walk through one example of uh, actually what a Fedora flat pack looks like. Uh, I am not going to spend a lot of time talking about the back end infrastructure details, uh, how we build flat packs in Fedora, because I think if you care about back end infrastructure, you're probably at the factory 2.0 talk rather than this talk. So, so just um, start off by talking a bit about the basic idea behind Flatpak. We have, this picture represents the um, traditional view of a Linux operating system. There are, it's a unified whole. There are lots and lots and lots of components within it. You know, a lot of them are very key, like the init system or your display server, the kernel, of course. There are libraries that all of these um, components pair, depend upon in a shared fashion. And then you have applications. And generally, we package applications the exact same way as we package all of these um, system components. There is no real distinction between how we package the GIMP and how we package um, system D. So that causes some a number of different problems. Um, one is that when we look at these very core system components, we think they should actually be integrated very deeply with the operating system. We expect that there would be a lot of dependencies, and we wouldn't really expect that you could take the Fedora 26 version of System D and swap it out for the Fedora 27 version of System D, and things would just work. Um, there are also a lot of dependencies on the, the actual distribution that a Fedora package is going to look a lot different from a Debian package. Um, those things to gather make it very, 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 very difficult for somebody who's external from the distribution world to make a package for distribution. They actually have to know exactly how the details of that system work. And, you know, there are, you know, because packages are tied to particular versions of particular distributions, in order to reach a significant fraction of the Linux community, you have to make a very large number of packages and update them continually. And that's not just not really feasible. But um, beyond that, their security model here is not really what we want. If you have um, treating the GIMP at the same level of system D, then we certainly don't have insul security installation time. The GIMP package can replace any file in the system. It can change your, um, your system configuration. It can drop new files into Etsy. It runs the package scripts as root. But also at runtime, we don't have any barriers there. We can't, if you have the, the GIMP running there, it has access to all the system, the files in the user's um, session. It can sniff your bank passwords, access your webcam. Everything is, is bad there. And that's because we simply are trusting the application that we have to say, I think this application is perfectly good. But we, that's not usually a real world situation. We usually want to say, well, I somewhat trusting of this application. I trust the GIMP to edit my image files, but I'm not going to trust it entirely. I don't think it needs to also have access to my bank passwords. So we like to be able to create security boundaries around applications. And that's simply not possible in this traditional model. So sort of the evolution of that is we're going to say, OK, we're going to make the operating system an integrated whole, and we're making applications separate integrated wholes. So they won't use the same libraries as the system. They will use their own set of libraries. And that then allows us to upgrade applications independently to create security boundaries. But then we have copies of libraries in every application separately. And that's something that's less than ideal. It causes duplication of disk space. It causes extra memory usage. And it means that if there's a security problem in a library, then you have to update every application independently. So the idea that Flatpak takes is to have a runtime, which is essentially a, a set of libraries that we pack up independently from the operating system 
And instead of having application depend upon the operating system libraries, it depends upon our, our runtime. Now, if we had only one runtime in the system, we'd still have a problem, because then when I switch from the Fedora 26 um, runtime to the Fedora 27 runtime, I'd have to update every single application. So it's even better if we can have multiple runtimes in the system. We can say, we'll have a Fedora 26 runtime, we'll have a Fedora 27 runtime, and maybe if I want to run an application that would build against Debian, I'll have a Debian runtime. So this is sort of, this is the picture of the flat pack application model. Mobile applications, separate from, the, separate from the operating system, depending upon multiple runtimes. When I say applications, I want to be clear that I mean desktop applications. Flatpak has a limited target space. Um, I mean something like LibreOffice or the GIMP or TextCard, or even a pr proprietary application like Google Chrome. But I don't mean a server like MariaDB. I don't mean WordPress. I mean, WordPress is an application, but it's not a desktop application. And I don't mean a command line tool like VI. And I mean, the reason for this is that if we I say we're going to handle desktop applications, then there's a lot of specific problems at those address, like how do we open a file securely? And there's a set of interactions with the user that involve a user interface, a, a GUI. And those are really distinct problems from the problems that I want when I'm deploying a server somewhere. OK, so that's a model. Where are we going to get Flatpaks from? Well, one of the goals of the Flatpak project is that Flatpaks can come from application creators. From If the GIMP project wants to release a nightly binary of the GIMP, Flatpak provides a way of running that across distributions and makes it feasible for them to do that. If um, a proprietary software company wants to release a binary for Linux, they can release, reasonably do that without creating 20 or 30 or 50 binaries. But that's not the only place we expect to have Flatpaks, because there's actually some real benefits from taking existing distribution packages and putting them into the Flatpak. We still have these upgrade and um, advantages. We still have this flexibility where we take an application and split it away from the operating system, and we still have the security there. So that's what I'm going to concentrate on talking about today, is how we um, build Flatpaks out of distribution packages, and less about how somebody upstream could build a Flatpak right directly from source. And the same split is for runtimes. There are upstream runtimes um, that have been created sort of to get Flatpak going that are built on a Yocto base, and there's like a generic free desktop runtime, there's a GNOME runtime, a KDE runtime. But once we start looking at making Flatpaks out of distribution packages, then we'll need a Fedora runtime that's built out of Fedora packages. So we're going to talk about how we build the, create the Fedora runtime and use that to build um, or Flatpaks. And as I said, we have to, with those, we still have the advantages that um, we can, um, well, okay. So, so I guess the, the question then is wh why do you want to, to build uh, Flatpaks out of distribution packages? Why don't you just want to build everything from source upstream? And I'd say that there are sort of three major reasons for that. Why the idea of building Flatpaks out of Fedora packages makes sense. First, there's not always an active upstream. There are, say, roughly a thousand graphical applications packaged in Fedora. You know, a good number of those have active upstreams. Other ones haven't been touched in three years, five years. But we'd still like to be able to have somebody to build them into flat packs, and that the Fedora packagers are a very natural community to do that. There's also, we actually have existing build recipes. We have a defined definition of what goes into the application, what packages it requires, how you build it from source. We'd like to reuse that information as well. And then finally, and very importantly, Fedora has a security update mechanism. When there's an upstream CVE, we track it down to a package, we release an updated package, and we build updates from it. If we're just building Flatpaks out of source, that mechanism isn't there. And so we'd like to take the Fedora updates mechanism and say, when there's a OpenSSL um, security vulnerability, Let's find all the flat packs that include a package, that openness to sell package, and automatically rebuild them and automatically release them so that the person doesn't have, people maintaining the flat packs don't have to individually worry about all these individual security holes. 
So um, I wanted to just talk a little bit more about how flat packs work on a security point of view, because I think that's an important thing to understand if you're you know, learning how to package a, a flat pack. Um, so by default, a flat pack, if you don't give it any extra permissions, has no permissions. The default state of a flat pack is it can't talk to the outside world. It can't talk to the network. It can't access any files. It can't open a window. So by default, it's basically entirely useless. Um, but then, so you have to start giving it some permissions. And there's a set of permissions which are sort of can be considered safe permissions. The ability to go out and talk over the network to external servers is a pretty safe permission. The ability to talk to the Wayland display server, which is a secure protocol, is a safe permission. Um, that just those two permissions by itself would allow you to do some set of, of applications. But you often want more deep integration with the operating system. Like you want to be able to read the user's files or use the webcam. Well, we can define other permissions which are unsafe permissions. Talking to the X11 display server or reading any file in the user's home directory. Now, so we'll, if we give an application those um, permissions, we've eventually broken the sandbox. At that point, the application is not sandboxed anymore. That still actually is not useless. If we want to take an old application, we basically have to, to do that to, say, to package it as a flat pack. We can't require an application to be rewritten to use entirely new models. So we can still get the sort of um, packaging advantages of flat packs by running an unsandboxed flat, flat pack. But we also want to find a secure modern way of doing that. And this is something called portals. So it's, well, you can think of permissions as being punching big holes in the sandbox. A portal is a very, very targeted hole in the sandbox that has um, a specific design for the purpose of deepest interface that was designed to have security in mind. And usually the way that security is added is by involving the user into the flow. If we think about opening a file, we don't want to say, does this application have the permission to access any file in your home directory? That's a very big hole. Instead, when the user wants to open a, a file, we present a file dialog. And when the user selects a file, by selecting that file themselves, they've implicitly given that permission there for that one file. So if, if we can involve the user into the flow, then we've made um, a much more natural and a much more limited way of give, giving um, permission for an to do something. Um, there aren't, you don't need a whole lot of portals. Um, the ones that sit there, the file, friend, show a, show a web page, get the network status. Those are, there's a few more existing currently, but those are the ones, those are almost a complete set. You know, we expect there to be roughly 10 portals in the, even as Flatpak evolves, not 100 or 200 portals. Um, portals, the portal system that Flatpak implements has multiple backends. So if we open a file dialog and you're running within the KDE desktop, you can get the KDE file chooser instead of the GNOME file chooser. Um, this could be extended with other backends, but currently we have GNOME and KDE ones. Um, and as I said, it's user interaction which makes it safe. So let me, the only demo I'm going to do here is um, a quick demo of how portals work. I'm going to start with the GNOME recipes application. So this is an application that was largely written to be a demo of flat packs. Um, you know, it, it has um, recipes that are contributed by GNOME contributors. Um, and you know, it provides a nice interface to when you say start cooking to walk you step by step through the, the some directions, hopefully with minimal touching your screen. Um, so, but it also has down here you can see there's like print and share buttons. And these both are going to go through a portal. So I want to print this um, recipe. I hit print here. Yeah. And it pops up a normal pr known print dialog. Now, certainly the old way of doing it, to have an application be able to print, you'd have to be able to talk to the cup server. They'd have to be able to see every single printer that was on your network, find out all the capabilities of all those printers. And by that point, you've actually created a fairly significant security of a hole there. You know, maybe that printer also has a scanner capability, or you know, we've exposed a lot of detail about your system there to the application. But um, on the other hand, in the flat pack world, 
basically the, the application asks the outside, the runtime, to put up a print dialog. Then once the user selects a printer, the application gets back um, very, you know, here are the margins, it's double-sided, you know, this color is black and white. It creates a PDF file, it's, then it sends it back out, and it goes to whatever printer the user has selected without having to give the applications very broad um, permissions there. And if the user popped up the print dialog and said, I want to print 10,000 copies of this document, you know, the user wouldn't, would just say, well, no, that, that wasn't what I wanted to do and close it. So once we didn't have to trust the application with any sort of upfront permission. You know, file log, logs work the same way. If you want to do something with email, the way that the sharing dialog does is pop up, prints pop ups a pre-populated email with the recipe in it and they can either choose to send it or you can choose to not send it. So that's sort of the case of portals. When portals are working properly, you don't know they're there. It just looks um, completely transparent to you. In a few cases, there might have to be explicit requests for permissions. An example would be a location portal. If you want, application wants to know where you are, then you probably have to ask the user, can I share your location data with the application? Because there's no natural place for user interaction there. But that's something we've tried to minimize instead of having the sort of um, old Android style of upfront permission lists. So, um, a little bit more talking about sort of generic flat packs. Um, the way that flat packs work is that every application gets its own file system namespace. So its own sort of mini view of the operating system that's separate from the outer op operating system. Um, the runtime is mounted on slash user, that's all the shared libraries and shared binaries are there. The application on the other hand is it's all that slash app. And that's sort of important from the view of how we make things from Fedora because since the application has a, a different prefix, you can't take an existing Fedora package and um, just without rebuilding it, turn it into a flat pack. Building a flat pack inherently involves rebuilding the application. So Dan? It's Etsy. It's Etsy um, also comes from the runtime. So it's, um, it, um, so I mean, the Etsy password on most flat packs will simply be a default um, Etsy password, similar to what you might have if you, um, no, so there's no, the, uh, every um, flat pack will have its own, um, actually uses a UID namespace. So there's no need to, you know, no need or expectation to pull in a lot of outside stuff. Actually, I don't, no, actually, I don't really know the question about this. I mean, absolutely, if you do look up the user's details, you should get the right name for the user. So we may do something to put a stub you can say password into the file pack. So that would happen sort of at the runtime level. Is, so if some things happen at the build time level, we create file systems then sometimes things happen at runtime where when we assemble these namespaces, we do a few tricks there. And there may be a trick from Etsy password. Um, but we do need to rebuild applications. So we'll talk about how that goes about. Um, there are other kernel security features are used in the sort of same way they would be used for a container. Um, there are, as I said, the UID namespace. There's uh, PID namespaces so you don't see all the other processes. You just see the processes running within that flat pack. Um, there's a set comp filter so that the application doesn't have um, access to a lot of system calls, doesn't have any business accessing. You know, generally, a lot of times when a security um, vulnerability is discovered in the kernel, it involves some very, very obscure system call that most applications would need to use anyways. So the, a set comp filter is used to forbid access to all those obscure system calls that really applications shouldn't need to use. Um, so to store a flat pack on disk, um, the technology is OS tree, which is also what we use for Atomic Host. It can sort of be seen as being um, Git for binaries. It's ways of storing binary trees, the same way Git is a way of storing trees of source code. And one of the big things that Git that gives you is duplication. If I have two flat packs and they have exactly the same file in them, you know, maybe for whatever reason, this happens more than you think. Um, it will actually be, we'll say, only once a disk, and if um, 
both applications load up that same file by like a shared memory map, it would be shared in memory as well. And then um, sort of the standard model for distributing flat packs is to use OS3 as your distribution mechanism. In that case, you also have this duplication on the network. If you need to download a file twice, you'll say, well, I already have a file with this checksum. I don't down need to download it from the origin again. Um, and then finally, OS3 is designed to emphasize atomic updates so that if I want to take you know, an application, I want to apply some updates to it, and then I want to start the new version, I don't have to mutate the version of the application which is currently running. I instead create a whole new tree, which is the new updated version of the application. And then once I've gotten the update done, I start the application with that new tree. So it's a, a safe way of doing updates. Um, but um, in terms of, there's actually also a second way of distributing a, a flat pack, which is called an OCI image. OCI images are from the Open Container Initiative, and they're essentially a standardized evolution of the Docker format. Um, and you can take a flat pack, and you can also build it into an OCI image. And I mean, there are a couple of advantages of that. One is that compared to OS3, there's not a ton of small images, a ton of small files. So one of the problems with OS3 distribution is that you know a large OS3 repository might have millions of files in it, and if you start like mirroring that by rsync, that really just does not work. It also, it's a lot of individual HTTP requests. Um, but it also, by getting conversions with um, server containers, makes things easy on the infrastructure side. We don't have to have two ways of building applications in Fedora, we can have just one way. And it makes things easier for a system administrator. They don't have to have one way of serving application for their servers, and then maybe an entirely different way to do it for their um, desktops. Yes. Is that transparent to the user whether it's uh, the package of the OCI image or using OS3? Yeah, it is. Um, I think I have, a, I have a, a picture here that essentially what you have a set of what are called remotes that are configured for your system. These are places you can get packages from. And some of them can be OS3 remotes, and some of them can be OCI remotes. Um, and the user, if everything's working properly, won't notice the difference. They just see a set of available packages. And, and I should emphasize that. I should say that once you download an OCI image, it's locally exploded into an OS3, so you still get the on-disk duplication. So, so how do we go about creating flat packs from Fedora packages? Well, um, first, I mean, why do it? What, you know, why don't we just use the upstream ones from sources, but well, we want the sandboxing, we want upgrades without rebooting, we want to be able to try out some pack applications for Rawhide without upgrading my entire system to Rawhide. And uh, finally, another reason is that, you know, in Fedora, we're moving to this model of the atomic host and atomic workstation, where the core operating system is distributed as a tested unified whole. Um, and if I want to I, I don't want to like insert packages into that test unified whole. I want to have my package leave my operating system as it is, as a single OS tree, and then have my applications independently there. It's a flat pack is a very natural way to layer an uh, application on top of a common workstation tested sort of tree. So at the level of you know Fedora, diskit, and infrastructure, the model that we really are promoting for flat packs is that flat packs are Fedora modules packaged into containers. Well, let me modify that a little bit and say that they're a very particular sort of module packaged into a very particular sort of container. But in general, we're trying to completely converge the view of, of a flat pack so that we're not creating some entirely new set of, of objects within the Fedora infrastructure, within the minds of a Fedora packager. But if you learn how to create a flat pack, it's very much, you learn how to create a module and you learn how to create a container. So we're saying, trying to say that. These are the same things and we're not trying to create a lot of extra complexity around this. So there's one module in Fedora, the Flatback Runtime module. Then you have a separate module for every application. So, you know, the GIMP or Inkscape would have their own module within Fedora. Um, they are um, the Fedora Layered Image Build Service which is sometimes also called the OpenShift build service, is 
charge of building containers within Fedora. It's also uh, in charge of building flat packs. And registry.fedoraproject.org, which is what distributes um, currently distributed containers, is also what's going to be distributing flat packs as well. So within sort of that world, flat packs are very much equivalent to containers. Um, so I mean, I wanted to talk a little bit more about modules here, because as opposed to containers, it may be a little bit less of an obvious fit. Um, you know, you could take flat packs and build them directly out of Fedora 26 content without ha introducing modules there. But um, modules, one thing that they give us is this ability to rebuild a, a package with a different prefix. Like if a mo package within Fedora 26 is built exactly one way, but modules have, have this sort of one of the basic ideas is I can take the same source, source from disk git and build it different ways in a different environment. And one of the different environments I can build it in is an uh, environment with different RPM macros that set the prefix to be slash app rather than slash user. Um, like any other uses of modules, using them for flat packs gives the application maintainer a lot of flexibility. You no longer have to be in agreement with every other Fedora package you're about what version of each library you're using. If one application needs one version of the library, another application uses a different version of the library, then they can do that. Uh, and you, you can deal with your application at your own tempo. You can say that I'm only going to maintain one version of my application, and I expect people on Fedora 25 and 26 and 27 all to be able to install it very via flat pack. It's generally giving more power to the um, packager, though also more responsibility. Um, and you know, furthermore, we're using modules there because that's the way Fedora is moving. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time building my infrastructure that is related to Fedora as it was, I want to make sure that we're building something that's really aligned with the way that Fedora is going in the future. And, and finally, because I'm being aligned there, it's a lot easier to get changes into Fedora infrastructure. I'm saying, telling everybody in Fedora infrastructure, we need to do add yet another component, another service. There's going to be a lot of resistance to that. Um, as I said, I'm not going to talk a lot about what's internally going on within the Fedora infrastructure because I don't think people who care about that are at this talk. Um, there's sort of some key things being used as the module build service is what, is what actually goes and builds your module, takes the definition of the module, and coordinates all the building of packages that make up that module. Once modules are built, they go into the product definition center, which just says, here are the packages which make up this module. There's something, there's something called the on-demand code service, which takes modules and puts them together into YAML repository. As I mentioned before, there's the Fedora layered image build service. And then finally, there's registry.fedoraproject.org, which is the public facing registry um, for containers. And when we're at, as we add flat packs for flat packs as well. So we'll move on now to an example. An example I'm going to use is the IF Gnome, which is the a very simple image viewer, which has been um, sometimes been the standard image viewer for Gnome and sometimes been a uh, it's one of the standard image viewers for GNOME. And to make a flat pack out of it, you essentially have to create two um, files that describe how your, your flat pack is going to be built. One describes the module, and one describes the container. Um, so the first one is the module MD file, um, traditionally called the name of the module plus .yaml. It describes um, what packages make up that module and what um, the module depends upon. So if you look at this, this is the first half of the module MD file. Um, has some sort of generic metadata in it, like a summary description. And generally, in the Flatpak world, those can be automatically propagated from the uh, summary description of, of the package. Um, it gives a um, set of build dependencies. And for, for Fedora, Fedora 26, the set of build dependencies are pretty complicated because the module structure is still evolving. I don't necessarily expect that people will in the future will have to say that I want Perl so that my auto comps, my auto make scripts run correctly. Probably some of this will simplify in the future. But the, there's also the require section that says what you need yet at runtime. And for an arbitrary module, this could be complicated. For a flat pack, it's very simple. You need to say, I require the flat pack runtime and the version of the flat pack runtime you need. So that's going to be the same for every um, every module MD file for a flat pack. 
There's also a profile section which says, here are what packages from this module I want to install. And again, this is really simple for Flatpak applications because usually the only package you want to install directly is the application itself. Then it will pull in by dependencies any libraries it needs. So this, this half of the, um, the module MD file is pretty simple. It's much, much of this could, can be auto-generated. Sort of the second half is the more complicated part, which is the list of components that you need in your, in, within the module there. And essentially you need every package that you depend upon, which is not part of the runtime. And you know that could be a pretty big, um, so you also want some tooling to auto automatically generate this as well. You don't want to be sitting there saying, comparing two big lists of packages. Here's everything my package requires. Here's everything in the runtime. Let me figure out which ones are different. Um, so we have some tooling there, or and are working on some tooling. Um, there's something called Flatpak Module Tools, which is uh, uh, some Python scripts I wrote that um, do sort of development tasks for Flatpaks. So there's one called Create Module MD. And if you run that with, you can say Create Module MD from package EOG, it gets um, the EOG package. Um, looks at the summary of the description, look at what's required, compares that to what's in the sort of Fedora 26 to figure out the complete set of dependencies, and writes out a, sort of a template eog.yaml, a module md file. So this is Flatpak specific, it's still pretty rough. Um, there's a generally an effort um, to do the same thing for modules in general, and we expect the long term there will be some standard Fedora tool for doing this process of taking an application uh, RPM and turning it into a module. Um, something there's a start in something called depth chase, which does the dependency part of it, but doesn't actually write out a skeleton module MD for you. But um, I'm not sure exactly where we're going to end up in the long term, but there'll be something there for modules. Um, so that's half of it. That was what describes your module. But then we also need to describe a bit about how that module is turned into a flat pack, in particular about the runtime environment, what permissions that flat pack needs. So um, for that, something called a flatpak.json. This is a JSON file with some keys in it. This is uh, very based upon something called a flatpak builder manifest. Flatpak builder is a tool for building flatpaks from source, and a lot of what that has is going to be how to build the source code. But if, if you remove take that, remove all of the instructions for building the source code, then that's basically what's left is what's in the flatpak.json. Um, and you know, some of this is just sort of simple metadata. Flatpak identifies applications by these sort of reverse domain names. So there's like org.org um, is the ID of the application. The complicated part here is something called finish args, which is a really awful name, but um, it basically defines your permissions. And it's called that because it's all arguments that you pass to Flatpak build finish, um, which is almost an implementation detail. But I wanted to be consistent with the Flatpak Builder JSON, which is why I left the name. Um, so you can look at the man page for Flatpak Build Finish to figure out what you need in your finish args. Uh, but generally, so this is this um, EOG is an old application, isn't sandboxed, so I say that it has access to the host file system, to the user's files, has access to X11, it then has access um, to DCOM, um, which is the user settings. So this is like sort of what it looks like for an unsandbox application. A sandbox application would generally have a smaller finish org section because it would need less permissions. So how do you take those two files and then build them into a flatback? Well, um, if you're doing a local build, which works currently, you you first need to build a module, and the um, modular OG team has a tool called MBS Build. You can do MBS Build local. It will download all the necessary bits and then build your module md file locally and create a sense of local packages, sort of like a mock build. Um, and then you can use another tool from Flatpak module tools called Flatpak module create Flatpak, which takes those locally built packages and turns them into a Flatpak bundle. And then if you want to try it out, you can Flatpak install the bundle and then you can try running it, just like any Flatpak. You could run it from the command line with flatpak run, or you could go to the your application launcher and launch it from there. Now, 
But that's not the long-term goal. The long-term goal is to build an Infidor infrastructure on Infidor build servers. So um, it's actually not that different. Um, I showed first that you it should be in disk get if you're going to build in, in uh, Pythic infrastructure. There's a uh, modules um, namespace which contains all the modules. So you'd, you're, um, and then you'd say MBS build instead of build local, you'd say MBS build submit. And I'd fire it off to the Fedora module build server. It would take your file and turn it through code to and generate all the packages. And then, then we need to start a uh, build in the Fedora layer image build system. And the tool for that is Koji container build. And then th I've added an extra command to that flat pack build, which builds a flat pack instead of a container. And then you sort of say what you want to build and what module you have to build against. Um, so I mean, I think eventually we'll have some pet package integration so that the, this becomes a bit simpler. So you don't have that very long command line. But um, that's enough to get it built. And then theoretically, once everything's in place, that will get it put into the Fedora registry. Um, and then the basic idea about how to install it is that you would add a remote that points to the, well, either the Fedora registry or the candidate Fedora registry, which is where things are before they've been released. Um, then you can just install using Flatpak install from that candidate registry, or you could do the same thing through GNOME software, and you again run it as normal Flatpak. Um, so that's basically what the sort of process does and will look like for uh, creating a flat pack out of Fedora packages. Um, and, and the key being these two metadata files that you need to create. So, um, so yeah, I'll, I'll quickly go over where the, for the status and then take a, some questions if people have them. So the whole module bin part, part works fine in uh, Fedora currently. You can um, build against the Flatpak runtime module and get your application modules built with the right prefix. Um, the code to take that and assemble it into um, an OCI image and upload that to the Fedora registry, it's all working really well, but it still has to be merged upstream. And then finally, the, the part that needs to be there so that you can actually go to GNOME software and view all the um, packages in registry.fedoraproject.org and install them through GNOME software is, is still needs to be written, and that's going to be a Fedora 28 feature. Um, that's, you know, there are some workarounds you can do currently, or will be able to do once the rest of it's landed to install them for more clumsily, but um, I don't want to describe that in detail now because that's still sort of in, in flux. But um, that's a sort of overall vision, and I'd say that we're like 80% done with it now. Okay, so questions? Yeah? yeah? So I would take the normal standard RPM DNS of I don't know, install that. Yeah. And then I would install the flat pack. Is there a way that your si would, you, would my system like pick one over the other or so would they show up differently? So if you launcher? so if you went to like the Go application overview or the KD application launcher, it would show either one or the other, and it can only really show one of them. What's gonna show is the uh, Flat pack. Okay. Um, if you from the command line, you could either run EOG from the command line, or you could do flat pack run or gnome that EOG and run either one of them. Um, sometimes when you're building a flat pack, you actually want to change the application ID. Like if I have a building a light, nightly snapshot of the GIMP, I may not want to just replace the system GIMP with it. I may want to appear differently as GIMP parentheses mm -hmm. lightly. In that yeah. case, you can give your flat pack different application ID and then it will show up as a different entry. So it might be possible that you'd have two different streams of your Fedora module, one which is, just looks like the application standard, and one which is distinguished from, from it and has a different application ID, and those two could be installed at the same time, and you user will be able to pick one or the other. Okay. But if you don't change the application ID, then, then only one can launch. just override the original? Yeah. 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 I have three questions. Yes. <laughs> the first, uh, the first is kind of similar, but it's about platforms. When if you install some, uh, um, like a, a, a platform is a bundle of libraries, right? Yeah. So if you install one from your distribution and one from upstream, one from you can have s what? Which one gets chosen? Do so the priority. So you always application is always tied to a particular um, runtime. 
So it's not like, so different runtimes are thought of as providing a different user, different API, or different API. Oh. So an application is either built against org GNOME free desktop, or it's built against org Fedora project, or whatever other runtime. Okay, so the org for project doesn't provide anything that isn't GNOME? Yeah, so the, they, they might have many of the same libraries, okay. but there's no assumption that you could replace one with the other. Okay. I mean, that's, I mean, I think that's because one of the things with, with Flatpak is the strong assurance that if I create a Flatpak and somebody else runs it, it's running exactly as I created it. And so I've, I've tried, the, um, somebody has made a Flatpak for Spotify. Uh, yeah. I've used it and I, it failed on Wayland. Is it like a missing permission or something? It worked only on X11. So, I mean, I'm not I'm I, 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 mean, I, don't, I don't know the exact answer to that. It's mm -hmm. possible that it simply doesn't support Wayland. Like, ah. so, oh, they're like, uh, I mean, well, I was back in the, it actually the RPM that they built before works on Wayland. Yeah, well, it should work on Wayland. I mean, it should, <laughs> if it's built to work on X11, it should just follow, use X11 and work on Wayland too. So I actually have so no it, idea. It, there's nothing that that you involved in No, that. I mean, if you want, we can take a look at it later if you want to figure out what's going on. And it, 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 so if I understand correctly, the only thing that if, that you need to change in your application if you want to support that flat pack is if you want to have portals. Uh, and yes. there is, you can have an unmodified application run in flat pack yes. if you're not using portals. So, yeah, so there are two cases where you can not use portals. One is if your application doesn't need a portal. Yeah. I mean, so a game might not need any portals at all. The right. game just wants to display, take it from the user and display things to the screen. Or the second case where you don't need portals if, is if you want to run unsandboxed. And currently we don't, Currently, we don't make a big deal on sandbox applications. We don't say this is unsandbox; it's entirely unsafe. We're sort of eventually we probably will get to the case where we're say we really try to discourage users from using unsandbox applications. Mm -hmm. but we're not yet at the point where we can do that. Okay. But we hopefully over time, application authors will be using uh, portals more and more. And sometimes portal application usage is transparent to the, app the application author. It's in the toolkit. Huh. Like if you're using GDK um, and you're going through the right so you, if you use sort of the simple print interface that doesn't provide you a lot of details about the printer, then you, you automatically use the print portal. In some cases, you will automatically use the file chooser portal. So in many cases, you don't actually have, as an application author, you may not need to know anything to use the portal. Your toolkit may do it for you. Okay. So because I was thinking of those applications that maybe don't want to rewrite parts of the Yeah. Program. Well, I mean, you know, some of them might just need to run on sandbox for a long time. Yeah. You know, it depends on you know what pressure is applied to the yeah. others. And if they don't, it's not that close where people are like, we made a Linux thing, we don't want to touch it for the next 20 years. Mm. You know, but sometimes they're more responsive, and some people are. Some some close source um, options are definitely engaging with Flatpak. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Uh, there. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> So I'm working uh, in the quality engineering aspects of the languages. So I have a question that if I want to test a flat pack for say the fonts input method for local, so where should I start testing that thing? So is it Fedora 26 is right or? Yeah, so Fedora 26, I mean, in terms of like to general flat pack infrastructure, um, Fedora 26 is, is quite up to date and has everything you need there. It doesn't have the Fedora flat pack bill of Fedora packages but that should be um, pretty much the same either way. So like single internationalization should work the same whether, no matter how that back is built. So you can definitely start looking at Fedora 26. So do we need to build a flat pack ourselves or can we download it from somewhere and test that testing? There, there are flat packs you can download and test. So like if it's you go to, go to flatpack.org, you can, there'll be links to flat packs there that you can run with. Excellent, thank you. Okay, in the back. So um, it can be worked either way. The default in Fedora is that Flatpak is installed on installed system wide, um, and it works a bit similarly to packages in that if you have admin privileges, you can install a Flatpak system wide without having to authenticate as root. Um, but you know, it's a default system wide. But for testing purposes, if you don't have admin privileges, you can also install it just as one user. If 
Um, I think probably not because that's not really what people would expect most of the time. I mean, it's something that I think I don't. We could do that. I don't think we do. I think instead, what we do is we ask you to get, we ask you for min, uh, like you know, prompt you for uh, min user privileges. You know. Yeah. Are you going to release any applications that have only security privileges? Um, this created a pretty big ruckus when we came up on Fedora Devel. But um, I think the answer is we're going to see how it goes. We're, and then it's going to eventually be a, a, a decision for the packagers. Like if a packager, once this is mature, if a packager says, you know, flat packs are a better way of distributing my package. When I put it into a flat pack, it has sandboxing. I can release one version have it work across all the Fedora releases. Then I don't think we're eventually always going to say, well, no, you need to build it as an RPM too. But that's certainly, that's several releases out, probably not Fedora 27, clearly, because we we're just going to have the getting to the Fedora 27, not Fedora 28. I don't know. Fedora 29, maybe Packers will be able to do that. It's really a policy question that we're not going to establish until we um, until we actually um, get some experience. We're not going to set that policy. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I I don't know the. I, I, I'm, you know, obviously you're better off talking to Alex. Well, you know, they all use so. So you're saying if. I mean, the ones I played with so far. So, so you're saying, oh, so mandatory act. So, I guess my question. I mean, the big, the big thing that's about mandatory act control from this is actually. So, I mean, do you? Maybe it's maybe it can be a little more specific on your question there, because I'm not sure what question exactly. Uh, I'm saying are people building it now using the file system? Oh, are, are people actually using the portals? Yeah. Um, I think it's it's a mixed bag currently. Generally, app, very recent GNOME applications are going to be built sandbox using the file the portals, mm -hmm. but a lot of other applications that are more complex will not yet have imported to using the portal system. Something like OpenOffice would be a pretty big job. Because there's probably a lot of some sort of thread through the code there of opening up access random files, but um, you know, um, you know, I think I think it's going to be sort of an evolution, and then eventually we'll start putting the clamps down to tell people that they really need to sandbox the applications. Yeah, so I mean that's some some extent, you know, we don't want to put too many barriers there at the start. Because we don't want to say, well, you need to do second rewriting before you can create a flat pack at all. But um, you know, I think you're totally right, and I think it's um, it's a little bit chicken and egg. We have to build up the ecosystem from all directions and then get but I think there are a lot of I think our hope is that there are enough compelling advantages that we'll get there eventually. Yeah. Not, not, I'm not the right person to answer that. I haven't, I haven't looked at Run C's user space feature. Yeah. Oh, Go ahead. In, the, in the back first. Now that you're moving to the module thing, we're doing, doing that module or yeah. stuff. Is it still going to be compatible with other operating systems such as OpenSUSE? Open SUSE if OpenSUSE has flat pack. I think my same flat pack that I built with the door. Yeah. yeah. No, the, the module component is also on the build side. Once you actually build a flat pack, it's just a flat pack, and you can still take a flat pack, build up your RPMs, and run it on SUSE, or take a SUSE, SUSE flat pack and run it on uh, Fedora. So the, the module, the involvement of modularity is all on the sort of packager side and not at all on the user side. The, um, Eventually, the what you might see, a user might see eventually, is that um, Fedora flat packs are no longer versions Fedora 26, Fedora 27. You might just have a, 
you know, a GIMP 2.8 flat pack and a GIMP 3 flat pack instead of a Fedora 26 one and a Fedora 27 one. And Sean? Uh, you mentioned games or something that don't need portals. It's kind of an example of things that uh, don't access user files, like you put up a file dialog, yeah. but might need some file system access for like storing like save data or whatever. Sure. So is there a persistent like runtime directory that it can? Yeah, so I mean the default for, for a flat pack is that it has that the what's the XDG, XDG data dir, where an application that's sort of semi-modern with source files is um, persistently stored for the application there. So if you store files in there, you can still access your XDG data dir um, without Going through a portal, and anything you s you save there will be there next time the application runs. So, um, you know, if, if you obviously if the file expect if the application looks for a doc file in a random place, then it wouldn't be able to do it without modification. I, I think you know, we could we could theoretically mount something on on dollar home as well. I don't think we still would do so currently, so I'm not I'm not hundred percent sure about that. But yeah, do the run times pair to a particular kernel or minimum kernel? So um, in general, you know, I mean, in general, there's probably a pretty weak dependency between, the the kernel is pretty good at maintaining API and involving compatible ways. So it's not usually the case that something that's running unprivileged cares too much about which kernel it uses. Um, there are, the sort of exception to this is often graphics drivers because um, new features in graphic drivers might require new kernel features at the, the sort of kernel driver level. Um, and, and for that, we've actually, there's a, a system called extensions. So you can have, have a runtime extension, which is basically a way of saying, I'm gonna take this runtime and I'm gonna drop in a new graphics driver. Um, but, you know, you can certainly see a situation where um, the runtime could be updated to work with the new kernel version in some way, and an application would be able to take advantage of the new kernel version because it has the new runtime. But I wouldn't generally say that there's any strict parity between the um, the runtime and the kernel version. And I don't feel like that answers your question. Oh, well, I'm just wondering, uh, are the runtimes supplied with, like, Fedora 26? Does Fedora 26 okay. have its set of those runtimes? So it may be different than something you okay. get on ASUS or um, so so there might be generally we would like the situation where runtime can be used with any host operating system. Um, clearly the runtime does talk to the host operating system in different ways. They do need, need to communicate. So they, the interfaces they, they communicate over have to be stable. Like if the runtime talks to the Wayland protocol to say I want to put a window on the screen, then the host operating system has to understand that protocol. So there is, I can't just say that any runtime will work with any host operating system, but the expectation is that a runtime is not tied to a host operating system. It talks via standard protocols interfaces. So you can use the SUSE runtime with Fedora, Fedora runtime with SUSE. Yeah? Uh, can you compare uh, Fluxpack to uh, similar technologies in other operating systems? I mean, uh, OS X applications and Android applications. Are they similar or not? Um, I would say that they are in some ways similar, in some ways different. I mean, that's obviously um, not. So, I mean, I think um, the idea of using a sort of the file system namespaces is fairly specific to Flatpak, um, and well, and also it's something that shares with like Docker containers, but not so much with other operating systems because. Generally, other operating systems have had sort of more leeway to require application rewriting. So, um, so we're trying to do it in a way that's more compatible with existing applications, and, and file system names is provide a way of doing that. Um, capabilities wise, I think what flat packs provide are pretty similar to um, what you know what other operating systems provide in the newer sandbox applications. Like, I mean, both. Windows and Mac have been moving towards the sandbox model. I think when you, a sandbox flat pack or <laughs> sandbox Mac, Mac or Android application would have similar capabilities. Android's inter application model is much more complex, and I think that offers some real security problems. 
So because essentially an Android, their intents, which are their equivalent of portals, are not a fixed set provided by the, by the operating system. Instead, any application can offer any intent sort to any other application. And while it sounds really poor, really um, powerful, it's a huge vector for leaking permissions from one application to another and to another application, and also makes it very hard to establish a good user interface for it, because you know something that somebody's thinking about as an internal part of the application suddenly gets used in another application. And so I don't think, I think that the flat pack model is a more secure way of doing permissions than the Android intent model, though it's slightly less flexible as a, as a consequence of that. But yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think we're, you know, we're, we're in some sense trying to shoot a little bit smaller, not redesign everything, and provide more of the existing set of APIs instead of saying we're going to create a whole new different way of doing APIs. Okay, well, thanks everybody. It has been recorded, yes. Okay. I probably should have been repeating. I should have been repeating questions, but <laughs> hopefully it's a small enough room so that the recording will still be. I was looking at the laptop and I couldn't tell if it was actually doing anything. I, 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 I pressed the button. Okay. You pressed the I button. I didn't check the code. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what uh, what it is the adoption of flatbacks in other Linux distributions? Um. I would say that in terms of major distributions, I mean, certainly, I'd say, I mean, I think.